A superager is generally defined as someone over 80 who displays the mental ability of someone decades younger. An octogenarian with the memory of someone in their 60s, 50s, or even younger is a classic example of superaging. The research shows factors like regular exercise, healthy diet, and having a strong friend and family ties go hand in hand with superaging. Today though, we're gonna take the concept of superaging to a deeper level with expert in the biochemical mechanisms of health and disease, Dr. Dane Goodenow. You know, obviously eat better, obviously ex exercised for, you want your circulatory system and your oxygenation of the body proper. We need to do all those things for sure. But if we wanna have superaging, we need to strategically add things back in that we know become deficient. Which specific nutrient deficiency could mean the difference between living to 70 and living to 100? What chief characteristic going from our cells to our behaviors fundamentally determines lifespan? And which everyday activity, if done right, is equivalent to a resistance training workout for the brain? It's an actual physical process of the human brain. And that is maintained in superagers better than others. And it's linked to increased cortical volumes and certain thicknesses of certain areas of the brain. Welcome to Vital Signs, where we learn how to get healthier from all angles, from the biochemical and nutritional to the things we do that nourish our minds and our souls. I'm Brendan Fallon. Over several decades, Dr. Goodenow has issued patents, conducted clinical trials, and published literature on a range of neurological disorders, including Alzheimer's disease, ALS, and autism. Links to his related research and his book, Breaking Alzheimer's, are in the description below. There are different concepts around aging. Some people think of it as a disease. I'm interested for your insights, Dr. Goodenow. How do you see aging in the context of the neurobiochemical research that you've done? When people look at aging, we've been kind of programmed into looking at it like something that it happens to us. And so like an infection or a disease. And then, which has actually been the main reasons why we die, right? We get in an accident, we get infected by a bad virus, or we do, you know, something kills us early in our life. And so that's been the primary cause of human death for most of our existence. And so the average lifespan for individuals was typically in the 30s to 40s for most of, you know, so people would live longer, but that would be a relatively small proportion of the population. And so a lot of research has been focused on how to prevent death. Right. So and we've done a very good job of that. So the average lifespan of humans has increased dramatically over the past hundred some years. So now that average lifespan has gone from in the 30s to 40s to in the mid 80s and it's kind of plateaued. We've done very little successful aging beyond that. But what's interesting when we look, look at how good we've been at reducing what I call premature death is that we've been very unsuccessful at increasing our maximum lifespan or, in, or increasing the length of our health and vitality. And so when you think about aging though, what you're really thinking about is the progression to death. And so really the question now becomes, is really not what is aging, but what is death? And we think about life and death as a progression, but it's really one thing. And so the other part about it, aging and the trying to prevent your death or try to sustain your life for the longest time possible with the largest amount of vitality in it. What we're really talking about is a loss of life. And I think a lot of people forget about, we think that the absence of something is something. Okay, and if we go back to just basic physics, for example, when people think about, oh, my house gets cold or my house gets hot. Well, there's actually no such thing as cold. Cold is actually not a phenomenon that actually exists. You either have heat or you have a lack of heat. So heat either comes into your house or heat leaves your house but cold does not actually come in or out. And the same concept is with life. Like you can't really have, there's no such thing as death. You don't actually acquire death. You lose life. And so death is the absence of life. And so once we're born, once that spark of life has been initiated, it is basically on, okay? And it doesn't go off until we die. And that spark of life of function, of purpose, permeates our daily living, but it also permeates every single cell of our body. And so as we look at this loss of life or the loss of our ability to function, it comes through the first and second laws of thermodynamics, really. The first law is nature, you know, molecules or atoms or matter 
cannot be created or destroyed. We just kind of move things around, right? This is like energy transferring from one form to another, like uh, kinetic energy transferring to, to heat energy. Correct. Something like that. That's exactly it. So for instance, photosynthesis, when the sun shines on a plant and it, it interacts with the chloroplast and it converts carbon dioxide and water into glucose, what it's doing is it's not creating glucose. It is taking the carbon atoms from carbon dioxide and the oxygen molecules from atoms from water, and it's combining them into creating a molecule called glucose. So everything that comes into your body must come out. So ultimately speaking, life is a balance sheet. It's like an accounting. The two sides of the ledgers will always balance. Now, we may not always like how they balance, but they will always balance. And so ultimately, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Ultimately, the body will decay, degenerate, will evaporate into thin air. So those molecules just get transformed. The second law of thermodynamics is the law of entropy, which is all systems tend to reach a state of disorder, right? It's like the world hates order. And I usually tell the analogy of, you know, making your bed in the morning. Like the entire world hates a made bed. The, everything conspires to unmake your bed. You get up in the morning, you make your bed, it's beautiful looking. Then you put your clothes on it and it starts to get wrinkled. Or you sit on the edge of the bed and it gets wrinkled. And so, but you're always constantly applying energy back to your bed. So you physically have to go and smooth the bed out. So you're applying energy to maintain that order. And at a very simple level, everything in your body is that way. Okay, in order to maintain the order of the human body, we are constantly applying energy into that body to do that. The uninterrupted state of things is chaos. It's, it's only with, with intervention that things have order. Exactly. And so we, and we have to add heat, we have to add energy in. So our bodies burn, like we take, carbon, we take hydrocarbons and we burn them into carbon dioxide and water. And that energy, that heat energy, we use that energy to maintain the structural order of our bodies. As you can imagine, our body is much more complex than making your bed every day. And so all these systems of your body over time become harder and harder to maintain. So aging itself like, is not a disease, it's entropy. And this is where, as you start looking into the underlying causation of decline, it really comes down to some basic concepts of function and purpose and the ability to create and maintain order in the systems that we have. That's the opposite of, of entropy, right? You know, entropy is, is like chaos, like the parts right. of the body, the, the, the physiology falling into disorder. Correct. We have to maintain order. And so this is where the complexity comes in of the human body. It's complex in its enormity, but it's simple in terms of its individual parts themselves, right? And so the heart has a function, the lung has a function, the cell within a heart has a function, the cell within a lung has a function. And so over long periods of time, these, the ability to actually maintain this becomes harder and harder to do, like any complex system. And what people forget about the aging process is that this interplay between our function and our purpose. So at the end of the day, you need that underlying purpose and your, your body will then match the function for that. The whole concept of healthy aging is adaptability. The whole concept of life is the ability to adapt to a changing environment whether it's internal or external, that gives us our vitality, okay? And so our ability to adapt to a changing environment is 100% of our aging process. And you adapt to the environment around you. So you become a school teacher or you become a mathematician or you, you have a very different skill set. You adapt to the skills required of your system. And this happens at, even at the cellular level because every single cell of your body has the same DNA. Your heart cell has the same DNA as your brain cell, same DNA as a fat cell. But all of these cells have different purposes, okay? And then they have adapted to the purpose that they have to fulfill. And we forget the things that we think are stressful and bad for us in our life. Oh, it was, you know, stressful going through school. It's stressful trying to get a job. It's stressful trying to find a, you know, a spouse and compete and raise a family. But all of these things have time constraints to us. Right. And they provide purpose. They have a reason for us to get up in the morning, the reason for us to exercise and so on. And so when you take a look at these super agers, right, and you look at their their lives and their structure, most of them will have very positive social relationships. A big factor in super aging populations is that they maintain a positive social relationship mindset. Um, people are important to them. Their relationships are important to them because humans are social. Okay, We find purpose 
in the people around us. We find purpose in helping others. We find purpose in being useful to others. And those things of purpose give us a reason to get up in the morning, give us a reason to eat better meals, give us a reason to be healthy, because if I want to help someone else, okay, I have to be healthy myself. And psychologically and subconsciously, these things drive a lot of our behavior, because it does drive us to more positive behaviors versus more negative behaviors.